have a, a privilege today to have a guest speaker with us. He's a friend of mine, someone I met through Church Boom. A lot of you know that we're partners of and we're building this ministry, this organization called Church Boom. And this guy that's a guest speaker today by the name of Pastor Doug Garasic is on the lead team with me. For those of you that don't know, Church Boom is this ministry where we are partnering with uh, local churches and local church pastors to help grow their leadership and grow their churches all across the nation, giving them free resources, the things that we've developed here at Discovery, partnering with other churches that have developed great systems and resources and have been able to reach their communities. We're partnering with churches that, that may, if they would just have a little bit of help, a little bit of coaching, coaching, maybe some resources come alongside them that they could reach their communities and reach the lost for Jesus. And so we've been doing that all across this nation. And in 2020, I'll be traveling all across this nation with my good friend here that I met through Church Boom, you guys. We have a privilege, man. Will you help me welcome Pastor Doug Garasic? Come on, guys. Come on, bro. Love you, dude. Man, what an honor to be here. If you've ever wondered what your pastor would look like if he was a ginger, now you get to see that. You probably never wondered that, but now you at least have a visual for that. I came in with my jacket and hoodie. I go, are we twinning today? Come on, Pastor Jason. Love it. Him and his wife, Veronica, you know this, but I just need to say it, are very incredible people that God is using in an extraordinary way. And here's the one thing I want to say to you. Do not allow the extraordinary thing that God is doing here, do not allow yourself to treat it as if it was ordinary. This is extraordinary what God is doing right here. And babe, can we honor our pastors and thank God for them? Man, I come from Ohio, which is another state in America. Some of us don't know that there's other states outside of California. There is others. People live outside of your state, and yes, they are this pale. Okay, that's real, all right? I like to have a good time. I am a crowd participation preacher. What that means is I preach better the more you talk back to me. So I like amens, I like that's good, and I like preach your white boy. So on the count of three, shout out whatever's in your spirit. One, two, three. Yeah. All right, all right. One time I was in Texas, and I say that everywhere I go, and this guy forgot in the third row what I said to say, and it's towards the end of the message, you know, everything's wrapping up, and he's really hyped at this moment, and he screams out as loud as he can in this moment, preach it, cracker! So as long as you don't do that, we're going to be okay today. All right, Discovery? The ushers are ready to do something. Don't make them do it. Okay, they will remove you quick. Hey, before I throw a picture of my family on the screen, I want to say something. If you are a single guy in this room, I want you to lean in for the next 30 seconds. You might go to the club. You might go to the bar. You might go here or there looking for a girl. But I want to tell you something. The prettiest girls on the planet are, are in church. Ladies, can I get an Amen. I met my wife at church. My life was radically changed because of it. And I want to show you a picture of my red hot smoking wife and my two little ginger babies. Y'all got them pictures? Throw them up there right now. Bam! Come on! Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's called marrying up, son. All right? Let me tell you that. And, of course, those two boys are mine. We know that because they're gingers. All right? So that's evident. My wife is expecting our third boy in January of this year. My first son's named Parker. My second son's Ian. My third son, we're naming him Lincoln Fox. You know when you get to a third kid, you just don't care what their name is anymore. You just say whatever you want to do. So Lincoln Fox, that's what we're landing on. And uh, if he's not a ginger, my wife and I are going to have problems. We're going to figure out what to do with that one. I want to tell you, though, when you saw that picture of my family, I want you to realize that it might just look like you know, a normal family that you might see every day, but it's a miracle of God. And let me tell you why it's a miracle of God. See, I am the product of a 16-year-old pregnancy. My mother in 1984 got pregnant with me when she was 16. She was a 4.0 student. She was not someone who got in trouble. And all of a sudden, there is a problem in her life. She is pregnant, and my grandfather was an elder of the local church. And in 1984, it was not socially acceptable to have a teenage pregnancy. And so it was literally put on the table for their reputation as a family, should Lisa abort this child? 
and she prayed and she asked God, she said, God, what do you want me to do with this mistake that I have made? It is growing inside of me and I don't know what to do. And she felt she heard the voice of God speak to her. Lisa, if you give me this mistake, I will turn it into a miracle. So don't you just give up on what I'm about to do. And I want to encourage anybody in the room right now that might feel like you've got some mistakes in your life. If you give it to God, he somehow, someway takes mistakes and turns them into miracles. When I was around 18 years of age, which was about a year and a half ago, I know I look like I'm very young, thank you. When I was 18 years old, I became very interested in finding out who my biological father was. And I researched and I found his, my biological grandmother that I never met. And she, told, she started telling me the story of my family. And she started telling me that my dad didn't know his dad. And that his father didn't know his father. And as we started to peel back the layers, I began to realize that I was a fourth generation fatherless kid. And when my wife told me for the first time we were pregnant, I got this sick feeling in my stomach that I was not adequately ready to be a dad. And God whispered to me, Doug, I was a father to you when you were fatherless, and I will show you how to be a dad. And the generational curse that was going through your family stops because when you say yes to Jesus, your whole lineage changes because God is in the business of changing people's lives. Amen? Come on, that's a good spot for a preacher white boy. Come on, somebody. We about to go. So as my kids were first born and our two sons were in diapers, do I have any parents who remember the diaper era of their life? Anybody still going through that? We're going to pray for you after service today, okay? We know. One night, my wife was super stressed out. She was so tired of the, being a mom, the kids, everything was just on. You know when something just pounds on another, and she's like, I need a night off. And I said, girl, I want you to go out with your girlfriends. I want you to have a good time. Here's the card. Here's the car. Go do you, boo. And I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to watch these kids in these diapers, and we're going to have a good time. My wife is like, are you sure about this? I said, baby, I got this. And you know when your wife doesn't trust you? when she speaks to you like you're one of the children in the house. She's like, are you sure you can handle these kids for a few minutes, a few hours? I'm like, woman, I have planted four campuses. I've built a thousand wells in Africa. I've survived fatherlessness. I can handle these children for three hours tonight. Don't test me, woman. She's like, okay, okay, just, t just make sure. I have one goal. They need to live when I get home, okay? They're going to be all right. So she leaves. I tell the boys, they're three and one. I'm like, we're about to party tonight, y'all. This is going to be dope. I'm like, turn on the radio. Turn on the television. Crank it up. We got the cheap puffs. You know the giant thing you get from Costco? And we took it, and we dumped them on the floor. They're eating them like animals off the floor. Fist pumping. I mean, we're having a good time. Remember, then my little one's in diapers. He's smashing cheese puffs. And the next thing you know, he's like this. He goes, daddy. I got a boo-boo belly. I'm like, oh, you partying too hard? You got a little boo-boo belly? You all right, dude? He's going to be fine? He's like, oh. And then he does this. He goes, uh, uh, uh. And I'm like, what's going on, R2-D2? I don't know what these noises are coming out of you right now. Burr, burr, uh. And I'm going to say a term that every parent in the room is going to feel when I say it, okay? He did this thing called a blowout diaper. Who knows what I'm talking about? Ooh. I felt a shift in the atmosphere when I said that. Because you're thinking of that blowout diaper you dealt with more than once. If you ain't married yet, just get ready. It's coming. And all of a sudden, normally a blowout diaper is going to go up or is going to go down. This one went sideways. And I'm like, goo, what is going on? And we got hardwood floors. And he's like this. He's like all discombobulated. He's like, oh, my dummy. And he's doing this, and he's staggering. And he starts walking with his bare feet into the mess that he just made. Oh, it gets worse. And then he slips off of it, falls straight on his back. You like that core workout? I've been working on that. A little bit of that. And he's laying in it. And in the panic of laying it, he starts wailing his arms, and then he's making snow angels in the mess. Three seconds, this all happens. And I'm looking at him, and he goes, Daddy, help me. 
And I'm looking at him, and I keep looking at the front door. <laughs> looking at him, looking at the front door. And listen, there ain't no such thing as Father of the Year. I need to tell you all that right now, okay? That's just a myth. And I'm like, my wife will be home in about an hour. She can just figure all this out when she gets home. <laughs> I'm tapping out. He's going, Daddy, Daddy, help me. And I just finally, I'm like, okay. So I do one of these numbers. I do like this full straddle thing over top of him. And you know the strength that they say a mother has when a child's pinned under a car with this superhuman strength that they can lift a car? I grab this kid from the shirt he was wearing, and with no bend to my elbow, I like cyborg pick him up like this. I'm holding him up like this, perfect strength. And he's dangling with this dripping off of him. And he says these words that haunt me to this day. Daddy. One-year-old, cute little kid. I need a hug. <laughs> what? No. Please give me a hug. And I'm, gi- I'm not giving him it. It's just, I'm get hosing you off in the back. This is what's about to happen. And I don't know about you, but God sometimes speaks to me in the most unopportune moments of my life. Like a lightning bolt that hits right through my head. And I felt like God spoke to me in this moment. And he said, Doug, you're forgetting that that's what I did for you. See, I left the cleanliness of heaven to step into your mess on planet Earth. And when you were laying in your mess, wallowing in your self-pity, struggling in your moment, you cried out to me as your dad to pick you up. And I picked you up. And when you wanted me to embrace you, I didn't hold you at an arm's length. I brought you in because I'm your daddy and I loved you enough to do it. Don't clap at this. I'm like, are you for real right now? And I felt like God whispered in my heart, I want you to hug that kid. And so I said, here we go. So I hugged him, and we made a poop sandwich in the hug. Y'all, I got in my beard, real talk. We're going to say it right now. This is a healing place. And I hugged that kid like it was the last time I was ever going to hug him because I learned something that day, that the God of heaven that I serve and you serve, his mercy is greater than your mess that you're living in right now. And the mercy that as a dad I had for my son was greater than the mess that my son was in. And I'm here to tell somebody today, if you can get a hold of this, it will change your life, that no matter how messy your mess is that you're in right now, the God of heaven loves you too much to leave you in that mess, and his mercy is greater then that mess. And some of you are all like this. You're like, mm, I don't know if that's biblical. I've never seen that in the Bible anywhere. You know the people that their pants keep going above their belly button the more they talk? They're like, I don't know about that. You know that person? It grows. For that person, I want to prove to you Mark chapter 10, verse 46. Some of y'all, you need to realize this is in your Bible. Mark chapter 10, verse 46, here's what it says. Then they reached Jericho, and Jericho was known as the oasis in the desert. It was a beautiful place. And as Jesus and his disciples were leaving that town, a large crowd followed him. And a blind beggar, say blind beggar. It's interesting that we learn his label before we learn his name. It's interesting that we learn about him before we actually knew, learn the name that God gave him. I don't know about you, but I've been labeled some things from some people in my life. See, there's been some people who didn't think God's best plan for me, who thought that I wasn't going to amount to anything. They thought that I didn't have what it took. They didn't think I was talented enough. They didn't think that I was qualified enough. Nobody ever doubted I was good looking enough, but that's another point. But they would say things like, Doug isn't going to amount to anything. See, I didn't even graduate high school. I have no high school diploma. I got expelled my junior year. I need you to know something. It is difficult to get kicked out of public school, y'all. But I was committed. (laughs) I had a teacher named Mr. Kozar, who I love to this day, but there was a time in my life where he didn't think that highly of me because I did not apply myself to the moments I was in. And he said things like, Doug can't even string a sentence together if his life depended on it. Well, Mr. Kozar, I've written two number one sellers. How you like me now, baby? Come on, somebody. See, somebody's got to realize that. Hey, listen, that ain't hashtag humblebrag. I need you to know something, that if you choose to follow the labels of what other people put on you, you will never fulfill the labels God has put on you in his life. Some of y'all don't realize this, that God has labeled some things over you. 
God has says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. You're not an accident, even if your parents said you're an accident. God put you on this planet for such a time as this. Listen, you are meant to be more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You are meant to be weak. You're meant to be strong in Jesus. And I'm here to tell somebody, we are all going to believe labels. I'm just asking you to choose to believe God's labels over your life. God's got something to say about you that if you would get in that word, you begin to devour it for yourself, it would change your life. I don't read the Bible for self-help. I read the Bible for transformation in my life. Thank you, person in the back, for clapping. So we learn his label before we learn his name, and his name is Barnabas. And then the next part of the verse says this, that he was sitting by the wayside. Say wayside. wayside. That's an old English word that I decided to study in, in the process of getting to this. And here's what I learned. The Roman Empire was the first civilization ever to create indoor plumbing. If you're not grateful for anything else on this planet, are you not grateful for indoor plumbing? If you're not, go join the Amish. They live by me. I'm grateful for indoor plumbing. They created indoor plumbing. And in the process, they had the Romans roads, which connected all the cities and all the towns in their whole entire district. And what they did was they had a main road where all the commerce went through. And then they had a fresh water road that was like a ditch that ran the fresh water into the cities and into the towns. But if you can put your thinking cap on with me for a second, you would realize if fresh water has to come in, not so fresh water has to go. We find Barnabas not sitting at the main road where the commerce and life is happening, not even sitting by water, fresh water, where life is coming out of it. He is sitting by the wayside. He's sitting in other people's messes. How many times have you felt like you've been sitting in somebody else's mess? How many times have you felt like, man, God, how did I get here? Well, I didn't ever mean to be here. Why am I in this place right now in my life? I can't stand this, God. Why am I here? And God, have you forgotten me while I'm sitting at my wayside? And here's what I want to tell you as we read this scripture. God is about to show up in Barnabas' life. The last place he expected to find God is where God showed up. And I want to tell you something. The very last place that you expect to find God in your family. The very last place you expect to find God in your finances. The very last place you expect to find God in your situation right now is the very place he's about to show up in your life. We find Bartimaeus sitting by the wayside. Verse 47 says it like this. When Bartimaeus heard, say heard, heard. that Jesus of Nazareth, now remember that, don't forget that, was nearby. He began to shout out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Notice, he heard of the miracle maker walking by. At this time in the Bible, Jesus has not yet been revealed as the Messiah to come save mankind. So all of his disciples, all of his followers are seeing the miracles. They're seeing him as this young hotshot rabbi. His father was a carpenter, so he's known as Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son, who is just an average guy who's got some great teachings and some miracles he's doing. But this blind man could see better than everyone else around him. And he could see this guy as he heard about it. He goes, wait a minute. He's not just some hotshot rabbi. This is the son of David who's the promised Messiah who has got the power of God in his hands. He can, if anyone can change my situation, he can change my situation. So you got to understand something. There was so much power in the one word difference between Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus, son of David. Some of us have been missing God by one word. We've been calling him a good teacher. We've been calling him a nice option. If I like what he has to say more than Dr. Phil, I'll choose him. And we're saying if there's better options, then baby, I'm going to follow those better options. I need to tell you something. If God's going to reach his mercy in your mess, you cannot just treat God as one of the options. You have to start treating God as the only option in your life. They say you are either Lord of everything or you're Lord of nothing when it comes to this. There's so much power and recognize the difference in one word. So my oldest went to kindergarten this year. 
And as going to kindergarten, my wife was getting him ready for it. And one day they were driving in the car and he's back in his little booster seat. And she says, hey, Parker, are you excited about going to kindergarten? And Parker just wigs out with all this energy. He's like, yes, I can't wait. This is going to be amazing. I want to go to kindergarten. I can't wait to eat endless pasta and the world's largest meatball. <laughs> She's like, what are you talking about? Yes, I can't wait to eat endless pasta and the world's largest meatball. Okay, you are your father's son. I have no idea what's going on right now. She comes home. She goes, your kid. You know your wife is always disappointed in a child when they call them yours, not theirs. Your son thinks he's going to go to kindergarten and eat endless pasta in the world's largest meatball, Doug. And I'm like, really? That's so bizarre. And then it hit me. I said, we are watching basketball last night, and my son is starting to see commercials for the first time in the power of advertising, and he saw a commercial for Olive Garden, which has endless pasta and the world's largest meatball. My kid confused kindergarten for Olive Garden. Pray for my household, please. He thinks he's going to Olive Garden every day. I had to explain to him, dude, you got a 12-year sentence, and it ain't Olive Garden you're going to. He was upset. We had to take him to Olive Garden that night so he could see the world's largest meatball. You understand there's so much power in understanding the difference in one word. There's so much power, and I'm here to beg you today. Make Jesus Lord of everything. Give him everything. You might say, Doug, I don't understand what that looks like. How could I give Jesus everything? Well, I'm happy you asked. There are three things I want to tell you that if you want to write these down, these will change your life. That you say to Jesus, I'm willing. If you want me to give everything, I'm going to measure everything based on these three things. God, you have my time. God, you have my talent. And God, you have my treasure. Come on, that's a preacher. All three T's. Come on, somebody. That's called good preaching. God, you have my time. I'm not going to be too busy when you want to move in my life. I'm going to serve your house. I'm going to bless your house. I'm going to be there and be available for what your mission is for our community. God, when I'm in the grocery store, I ain't going to be too busy to not hear you speak to me about blessing that person. God, I'm not going to be too inconvenienced when you want to do something in my life that's going to require some time. God, this time that you gave me, the breath in my lungs is from you. I'm going to honor you with the time that you have given me. God, you have my talent. You've got my talent, God. The gift that you gave me. Some of y'all don't realize, listen, the greatest gifts a church could ever have is, I, I like to say it like this, there is gold in the pews. Let's mine the pews for gold because you have got more than enough in this amazing church to take on anything that God wants you to take on. If the talent of this church says, we're not going to hoard it for ourselves, we're going to give it to God's kingdom and let it reign with what ability God has given us. And the final thing, and this is the one that makes people the most uncomfortable, is, God, you have my treasure. God, you have my treasure. I am a steward of the money that you've given me. I've got two sons, one I trust and one I do not trust. I love them both, but we do not trust Ian. Here's why, and here's what I want you to realize. The one who is trusted is given more than the one who isn't. You want God to give you more? Show him how trustworthy you are with your treasure. You show God, it's yours, not mine. You gave it to me, I'll be a good steward of it. And if you want to continue to give it to me, I will continue to be a good steward of it. Some of us are all like, God, why aren't you blessing me? Well, what's your stewardship look like? Are you trusting him with your treasure? Are you hoarding it for yourself because you fear that God is not big enough to handle your circumstance? Ow! That felt like a butt spank. Let's keep reading. So when he shouted out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Here's what happened. The crowd said, be quiet. So he only shouted louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He only shouted louder. Let me speak to my generation for a moment. Because here's the problem with what I'm seeing in my generation. Is when the going gets tough, we find a new calling to get going to. 
There's this word called adversity that we treat like a cuss word. Oh, I don't want none of that in my life. Oh, I don't want to deal with that. Oh, this is getting tough. I need to move on to something else. And here's the problem with that. You will never get to where God is calling you if you're constantly running from adversity showing up in your life. Adversity is what births character in your life. You go through the fire of adversity and moments when everything feels like it's not working the way it should be. And you're going, God, why am I going through this right now? Instead of complaining, you begin to realize that when adversity comes knocking, God is about to level me up to a new place that I haven't been to yet. So God, thank you for the adversity. I'm going to accept it. I'm going to grow in it. And I'm going to let you do what you want to do in me through this adversity. Notice, no one cheered for Barnabas when he wanted Jesus. They all told him to be quiet. And his response to their adversity was to worship God even harder. Some of you have got to realize that when the devil comes knocking, he knows your number, that if it gets a little difficult in those situations, you're going to go back to the old you. So he goes, okay, let me turn the heat up in their life. I need you to start realizing when the heat gets turned up, it's time for you to grow, not time for you to go. I don't have time to teach this, but I just want to say it really quickly. A tree that is in a storm, when the branches start moving, that sends a signal to the roots, go deeper. It doesn't send a signal, get up and find another place to go. Go deeper. And I want to encourage you, where you're going to go in Christ, how far he takes you, the miracles that will unfold will always be on the other side of adversity that you handle. It will always be on the other side of how you say, I'm going to weather this storm, I'm going to handle this adversity, and I'm going to trust God. And when the devil thinks he's beating me, I'm only going to worship louder. I'm only going to cry out to God more. I'm only going to give more. I'm only going to pursue God more. I am going to show the devil, if you think you're going to beat me this way, you have no idea who you picked a fight with because God is about to do something in my life. Adversity shows God is on the other side of a miracle out of my mess. Let's keep reading. Verse 49 says this. When Jesus heard him, he stopped. Say stop. And he told him, come here. So they, this being those famed haters who were telling him to be quiet, said, cheer up. Come on. He's calling you. Isn't it interesting, little side note, that Barnabas didn't pay attention to his haters when they were telling him things he didn't want to hear. And he also didn't pay attention to them when he was hearing things that he wanted to hear. Don't allow popularity to trap the purpose that God has for your life. Because here's what you need to realize. Popularity is a trap the enemy will use to stop your purpose from coming to reality. Jesus starts blessing you and everybody starts liking you. And all of a sudden you start living on the likes of other people. Start living on the Instagram popularity. Start living on the people saying you're going somewhere in God. And you need all these words and all this encouragement all the time because you need it, need it, need it. You are looking for popularity and it's a trap the enemy will use to stop you from getting to your purpose. He could have went, everyone finally likes me. I love this. And he could have missed Jesus right in front of him with a miracle. Don't miss your purpose for popularity. The rest of the verse said it like this, that he threw aside his beggar's coat and came to Jesus. Now, when I first read that, I thought, okay, it was a hot day in Jericho. Maybe he had a hipster tank on. I don't know. And he felt like just taking it off to be cool and hang out and just wanted to go meet Jesus without the, maybe the little bit of a dirty coat. But then when I dug in, I found something out that was fascinating to me. I found out that the Roman government not only created the first indoor plumbing we ever had, they also created the first ever welfare system in a society. And here's what they would do. If somebody was disabled or unable to work, they would be brought before a Roman officer of the area. They would evaluate their disability, and then they would issue them a beggar's coat. They would then wear that beggar's coat to show everyone in Rome they have gone through the appropriate channels for benevolence, and now you can give your benevolence to them knowing they're not scamming you like some person is trying to work the system. Do you get what I'm talking about? So now when I read that, it changes the entire context. He jumped up and threw aside the very means of survival in his life. He threw aside the only way he got any income to live as a human being. 
He let go of surviving to get a chance with God to, sur- to thrive and under what God wanted to do in his life. He's leaving surviving for thriving. He's walking away from the old, letting go of what he knew to get something he didn't know at all. To say, God, I know your miracle will be so much better than my beggar's coat. And I'm going to let go of the old so I can step into the new of what you have for my life. Some of us are hanging on to our beggar's cloak. We're gripping it with our tired hands. And we're refusing to let go of that job that relationship, that idea of our life, that thing that we thought this is it, there's no other way around it. We're holding on to it with everything that we have, and God is here whispering to you today, let go of the old so that you can step into the new. And some of you might think, I want God to show me the new, and I'll go over there and look at it with my coat, and if it's good, then I'll go put the coat down. Okay, I'll buy that, and I'll put my coat down. And I can't fully explain it to you except for this. The Bible talks about there's a mystery to faith. And sometimes God just says, let go of the old and watch as your faith operates and we step into the new. Things are not going to look like they used to, but it's not going to be about surviving anymore. It's going to be about thriving. And I don't know about you, but there came a time in my life where I got sick of just surviving. And I said, God, I want to thrive with you. And God whispered my heart, let go of that, Doug drop that. Let go of your beggar's coat. But I'm familiar with it and I like it and I'm comfortable in it and I know you are. And we're never going to go where we're supposed to go because you're going to hold on to that, Doug. You have to let it go. So he throws aside his beggar's coat. Verse 51 says this. Jesus then says to him, what do you want from me? My rabbi, he says, I want to see. Now when I first read this, I'm going to be very transparent with you. And Pat, listen, next week, Pastor Jason is going to come back up here. He's going to fix all this, okay? It's all going to be all good. Part of my job is to make you appreciate the pastor that you got, okay? I'm going to say one more trifling thing, then we're going to get off this stage, all right? When I read that verse, I said, and this is just my flesh, I said, God, what a waste of a Bible verse. Duh, he wanted to see. Like, let's go back 2,000 years ago. Let's all pretend we're in the crowd with Jesus, right? And we're disciples, and we're hanging out, and we got our little things on. And here comes this guy being led by somebody with the cloth on his eyes. He's blind. He smells. He's getting brought up to Jesus. And we're all standing there. And if I'm a disciple of Jesus, I'm like, yo, this is about to be dope. Yo, get your phone out. We're going to put this on Instagram. We're going to TikTok this. It's going to be fire. Let's go. And I'm like, we're all ready. And he gets up to Jesus, and Jesus is standing there. He's like, what do you want from me? If I was a disciple and they had me on camera, I'd be like this. Jesus! What you mean what he wants from you? It's evident to everybody. The dude wants to. And so I said to God, what a waste of a Bible verse when I got all these other problems in my life that your Bible could help me with. And then he whispered to my heart. Because you know if you ask God to reveal things, he'll tell you things. I said, God, what are you trying to say here? He said, Doug, I need to see how much faith that blind man had. Because imagine this. What if he got to Jesus? He says, what do you want from me? I just want a hug because my life has been tough. And I smell. And I want to just be encouraged. Okay, cool. Doug's here. He loves hugging people with poop on him. Go ahead, Doug. (laughs) See how we tied that joke back around? That's good comedy. Okay. What if he said, I, I, I just want encouragement. Yeah, we'll encourage you. I, I just need food. Hey, we got money. We'll pay for it. We'll take care of you. He wanted to see if this blind man was going to ask for possible things or impossible things. When was the last time you dared God to do the impossible in your life? When was the last time you said, God, the cards are stacked against me. This is not going to work unless you show up in my life. And if you show up, no matter what man thinks is impossible, you make possible. See, I want to tell you something. Jesus taught us, ask for your daily bread, and that's good. Ask for possible things. But I was guilty of just asking God for possible things. And I started daring God to do the impossible in my life again. And I want to tell you, that wayward child that you don't think is going to come to Christ, you start daring him to do the impossible in that life. 
that, 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 that financial situation that you think there's no way we're getting out of it, God, I will trust you how you want me to steward. The numbers don't make sense, but I'm going to believe that you can do an impossible thing in these finances as I align with your word. God, my marriage is on the brink. It is not going to make it. It's so far done and over. God, it's moving on. But I believe this. If you start daring God to do the impossible in that marriage, he has a way of turning things around that never thought imaginable that could be turned around. Dare God to do the impossible. And the final verse says this. Jesus said to him, go for your faith. Huh. Not Jesus' strength, not Jesus' ability, but your faith, Barnabas. See, some of us miss the power our faith has. Can change your life. The Bible says the faith, the size of a mustard seed, could look at the mountain in front of you and say, Be thou removed unto the sea. Don't get me preaching King James in here right now. I will go fire on you. When I start saying thou, you better watch out. It says you can take that seed, that faith, and you can move the mountains in your life. It says, Go because your faith has healed you. And the Bible says instantly he could see. And then my favorite part of the whole scripture. And then Barnabas followed Jesus down the road. The appropriate response to the miracle of God in your life is not to pick up your beggar's coat and go back to your wayside. The appropriate response to a miracle of God in your life is to follow God down the road for the rest of your life. I know this, when I said yes to Jesus, I was a wild partying 18 year old kid. I got fired from McDonald's because they were stupid enough to give me the keys to open the next day and I threw a party on the roof of that McDonald's the night before. We don't have time to talk about that story today. But let me just assure you, if you think somebody can party, you ain't met me yet, all right? And I remember when I became a Christian, I said, man, now I have to become boring because every Christian I know is like animal cracker and cinder block wall, boring. And God whispered to my heart, Doug, I made you unique. And your uniqueness gives you power in life. I didn't make you to fit in. I made you to stand out, kid. And let me tell you something. You used to party to forget your pain, your problems, your fatherlessness, your issues, your brokenness. You used to party to forget all these things. Now, Doug, I want you to party to remember how good I've been in your life and how the fact that others thought you couldn't make it. I said you could, and I loved you too much to leave you in your mess. So now I don't party to forget. I party to remember. And I follow Jesus down the road because the Bible says that I read that he came to give life and life to the fullest. Can I pray for you? God, I pray for every single person here at this incredible church.